Okay, um, let's start. Um, Alan, I'm going to introduce you, and I'll explain later what the Graafschap is, but no worries about it. Um, we'll start with you, uh, an architect and designer from New York City, a man who recently was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship in Fine Art, um, and you'll know why after we've spoken to you. He will tell you all about uh, rethinking teaching and rethinking learning, because that, that is uh, what he does. Uh, if we want to change our way of thinking, he says, we have to change our tools. Um, and that's how Alan Wexler thinks. Nelleke visited him, was fascinated by his house and I guess by his thinking, uh, and she invited him here in Zeist at Pink 17. So a warm welcome for Alan Wexler. Alan Wexler, cocktail party response number 11. What kind of work do you do? I was exposed to contemporary art as a student at the Rhode Island School of Design in the late 60s. Andy, Warhol, uh, Andy Warhol's initials, A.W., were the same as mine. Alan Wexler, A.W. This coincidence was too amazing to ignore. I wanted to become the Andy Warhol of architecture. Identification shirt. This shirt riffed on Marshall McLuhan's concept of the global village. In 1971, t-shirts did not have graphics printed on them. I created ID shirt that displayed a questionnaire where the wearer used a laundry marker to fill in personal interests and information. The intent was to connect strangers to public in public places and establish a sense of community. I consider ID shirt to be an early predecessor to Facebook. <laughs> At cocktail parties, I'm often faced with the inevitable opening question. What kind of work do you do? I had great difficulty answering this seemingly simple inquiry and found myself dreading social engagements. Setting out to solve these awkward cocktail party moments, I created 20 responses and printed them as business cards. <laughs> I now hand them out when the question arises. Alan Wexler, cocktail party response number 13. What kind of work do you do? I studied architecture during the late 60s, a period of great social turmoil. We were disenchanted with the current state of architecture. We engaged in a practice of anti-architecture, non-architecture, or paper architecture. Art galleries and journals became forums for the development of a new architecture. I'm trying to... The year I moved to New York City, the World Trade Center was nearing completion. It was the tallest building in the world. I thought of the tower's facades as huge blank canvases. Each evening, the person cleaning the offices would consult the calendar positioned at each window of the building to determine if a window shade was to be left up or pulled down, on, off a simple action creating a big impact. This is the binary system in operation. Or I should say this is my binary system in operation. The illusion is that the World Trade Center is sliced, dissected, rearranged, or transformed into other buildings. The Empire State Building or Notre Dame could be displaced to lower Manhattan. Coca-Cola Corporation could fund this project. This is a catalog of the types of building transformations possible with light or no light. These are some other possible transformations of the building. Alan Wexler, 
Cocktail party response number five. What kind of work do you do? A pulley, a lever, a wheel, and dripping condensate are a hardware I utilize to open a door. Low tech oscillates with high tech. I like switches, squeaking, creaking floorboards, the hiss of air escaping from a radiator on a cold winter morning, and the slam of a screen door are material for my work. This project is called Open, Closed, On, Off. A door can be either open or closed. Four pre-hung doors form a square module. One door can either be left open, two doors open, three doors open, or all four doors can be open. 24 of these modules are joined together. Some doors are fixed to be open, and some doors are fixed closed. The museum staff uses one of a number of diagrams to create a different pattern of the doors each week. A complex maze of hallways and closets feels both like a home and a nightmare. This is called drywall drawing in memory of Sal LeWitt. This I did in 2011. And it's an unsuspected collaboration between a builder and an artist. I emailed a set of simple instructions to the University of Manitoba Gallery in Canada. Construct an eight feet cube, drywall the interior with screws, and of course don't spackle or paint it. The lines in the head of each screw were extended with pencil until they hit the edges of the wall. The insignificant screw generates a complex drawing. The microscopic becomes astronomical. I call this drawn into architecture. My wife, Ellen, who's in the front row, she often collaborates with me on a lot of public projects especially, which you'll be seeing soon. Um, here she photographed me against, she photographed me caught in the web of the wall drawing. Essentially, I was trapped in architecture. Cocktail party response number 14. What kind of work do you do? I'm an architect in an artist's body. My studio is a laboratory. I sculpt with gravity and heat. I paint with rain. I use everyday and ordinary activities eating, sleeping, and bathing as media. I investigate the built environment archaeologically. My work looks at simple things. The sight line of two people sitting across from each other at a table. The many positions of two bricks in relationship to each other. How floor meets wall. My work defines habitable space and the wall that separates inside from outside. I invent ways to walk through walls. This is called, I want to become architecture, slash wall. The walls of our home contain and shield us, but they're not pliant to our soft form. Wall is an attempt to force the house to clothe me. Water is a resource that concerns everyone, everywhere. We have always used our ingenuity to invent ways to collect this most precious of commodities. While designing an outdoor shower, I sidetracked and spent a year creating works about water. Studying ancient Roman aqueducts, bathroom plumbing, and Japanese bamboo fountains, I saw that water is both a problem and an asset and determines the design of buildings. 
called Hat Roof, 1994. This is called Hat for Bottled Water. The bottles are like, cart it's like a cartridge belt, like machine guns. And a lot of wars have been fought over water. Flint, Michigan was way into the future when I did this project in the early 90s. This is called sink drawing. How can water be directed indoors to feed a sink and toilet? Water flowing from a faucet in our bathrooms is an awesome miracle. Bucket falls onto the pitched roof of the building and is collected in buckets that hang along the roof's edge. As each bucket fills, the weight of the water becomes heavier than the counterweight and the bucket drops to the ground. Alan Wexler, cocktail party response number eight. What kind of work do you do? My work is about the smell of wood the texture of stone and the sound of door against frame. I love tools. I buy a tool and invent a project to justify its purchase. I veered away from a traditional architectural practice, choosing to work at the scale of small buildings, furniture and utensils, so that I could touch, smell, saw, drill and chisel. I need to become physically exhausted at the same rate as I become intellectually exhausted. Chair Day, 1990. For 16 consecutive days, I spent eight hours constructing one chair from limited materials, wood, nails, and paint. Working at the intimate scale of furniture allows me to take risks that I don't take with larger structures. I work quickly and without hesitation. I do not judge my impulses. I am not a fine woodworker. I like to exploit bad craftsmanship. When things are too predictable and I become an expert, it's time to move on. Broken plywood chair. Originally it was titled Broken Plywood Chair in Memory of Charles and Ray Eames, but in visiting the Stedlick Gallery this last um, weekend, I realized that Garrett Rietveld, one of your amazing designers in I think around 1917, the early um, 20th century, actually bent and made a bent plywood chair. I sprayed the quarter inch plywood with water. Remember, I had eight hours a day to make a chair. I, spent, I sprayed the quarter inch plywood with water, wrapped it in plastic, and kept it in the hot sun. After seven hours, I attempted to drape it gently over an orthogonal frame to bend it. This failed. In the final hour, I placed the plywood on some bricks and drove my car over it, <laughs> breaking the plywood. Chair with wedges uses the joining technique of mortise and tenon, a square peg in a square hole. Because I lacked chiseling and cabinet making skills, the chair's joints were loose. Wedges resolve the problem. They strengthen and stabilize the chair, revealing structural forces and to my delight, became decorative elements. This is titled Bed Sitting Rooms for an Artist in Residence, 1988, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It consists of two rooms that function in a variety of ways. The wall dividing the two rooms have openings through which furniture components can partially or fully pass through. Two people, each wanting privacy, with a single bed and a chair in each room. A couple who want a sitting area in one room and a double bed in the other. A person who needs an empty room for work and a bedroom. Two beds on wheels roll through the dividing wall. Two lamps and sofa backs rotate through the wall. Four crates each contain one room of a house. Bedroom, bathroom, living room, and kitchen. 
I view each crate as if a diorama in a museum of natural history. I am looking at now, historically. The pillow, the spoon, the flashlight, the pot, the knife, the salt. These things are isolated and turned into sculpture, and their use into theater. Crates are normally used to protect precious artwork. A can of Campbell's tomato soup is included in the kitchen crate in memory of Andy Warhol. Crate House was inspired by Henry David Thoreau's book, Walden, and, by his, on his, and his reflections on simple living. I wanted to make a building or a house smaller than Thoreau's cabin at Walden Pond. When a room such as a living room is needed, a crate is rolled in through one of the four door openings. When an occupant is sleeping, the entire house becomes a bedroom. Coffee seeks its own level, choreographs group dynamics. <laughs> if one person lifts his cup, coffee overflows the other three cups. <laughs> All four people need to coordinate their actions and lift simultaneously. This is my American version of the Japanese tea ceremony. The Braun 10-cup Aeromaster coffee maker has been disassembled. Every part is separated and placed precisely into a case that looks like the kind of cases television repair people used to carry to our home when I was a child. Included in this kit of parts are the tools needed and the instructions for the reassembly of the original coffee maker. Imagine yourself each morning preparing that first cup of coffee. <laughs> Rebuilt Braun Coffee Maker 1991. I removed any element from the manufactured coffee maker that interfered with our ability to see the process of brewing. The structure holds in place the water storage element, the coffee filter holder, the heating element, the electrical contacts, and the switch. The carrying case is a cross between a Thomas Edison invention and refers to my crate house. It looks like a small crate. This is called Table for the Typical House, 2011. An X shape, an X is drawn through the dining table on a typical floor plan. What are the implications of this very simple action? Is this a representation of the American family? X shaped walls intersect a table creating four rooms. One bottle of ketchup, one bottle of mustard, one salt shaker, and one pepper shaker each exist in their own room, necessitating some interaction among its participants. Notice the diagonals of four people wearing a table. They're cut irregularly with a handheld jigsaw. This is, encourages four diners to communally regroup puzzle-like, to reassemble the tables into one. The following works from Breaking Ground explore the other side of architecture. This kind of side I feel like is often not taught in schools of architecture. The poetic and the non-functional, perhaps the irrational, the absurd. They investigate deep-seated rituals that form the basis of civilization and habitation our relationships to the natural world, our first marks on the primal landscape as builders. They hover between the real and the poetic and are constructed through a process that questions the reality of photography, drawing, and model making. For an architect, gravity is a material to work with, not against. Like rain, budget, and cold, they are media for expression. I want to lift the earth into the sky. I like to call this second floor an anti-gravity machine. That was referred to in one of the earlier talks, anti-gravity machines. Two too large tables for the Hudson River Park, 2006, New York City. Two horizontal planes appear to float. 13 chairs support a horizontal plane at table height. The chairs support the table. 
The chairs are positioned in the same way in the shade pavilion. The chair backs become columns that raise a plane seven feet from the ground to provide shade. As people sit like Greek chariot, they people sit like Greek caryatids supporting the roof. Strangers approach from different directions to face each, face each other in conversation. I also excavate into the earth. Overlook for Atlantic Terminal, 2009. Reminds us of those scenic off-road viewing stations our parents pulled to on long summer car trips. A much needed break from the expected and the everyday. Overlook is a break in a journey, a place to pass through, a place to observe the theater of people below on the concourse level while you wait for the train to arrive on the platform below. Although the piece recalls the rocky outcroppings along our national highways, Overlook questions the relationship between nature and mathematics, between the rendered and the pixelated, creating a balance between abstraction and representation. Overlook reminds us of the subway's subterranean existence and speaks about excavation, strata, and geology. Alan Wexler, cocktail party response number seven. What kind of work do you do? I study light under the guidance of Virginia Woolf. William Morris points to beauty in faded colors and decay. George Perrick encourages me to continue my research into the infraordinary. With Sir James Fraser, I study ritual and ceremony. Nicholson Baker encourages me to look closely. With William Lefebvre, teaches me about magic. D.T. Suzuki helps me to stop thinking so much. And John Cage asks me to be silent. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I think we will all change our business cards now and put a story on the back. Lovely. Um,